Welcome to The Real News, I'm Jess Lenore. The coronavirus pandemic has taken a staggering toll on the United States, which has just over 4% of the world's population, but more than 30% of the world's confirmed cases and 28% of the world's deaths. And in the United States, COVID-19 has hit low-income communities of color the hardest. Meanwhile, most states are rushing to reopen against the advice of public health officials. Well, joining us to discuss this is Sarah Lazar, web editor and reporter for In These Times, who has done an excellent series of reporting on COVID-19 and especially around issues around reopening and the power that corporations are wielding right now to shape public discourse. So Sarah, it's now something like 48 states are reopening this week um, over the objections of, of health experts and scientists. Uh, you write, in public discourse, the language of reopening is largely being conceded to the right. Um, talk about what this looks like, because you're, you know we see this throughout, you know, news reporting, whether you know whether it's newspapers or media. Um, you know, the right has really taken hold of this, and at the same time, where, when the government hasn't really provided a safe alternative to opening, um, and and also not given real benefits like many other countries have, you know, twelve hundred dollars stimulus check and unemployment benefits for those who can get them right now, um, it's really put people in a tight spot. Yeah, so we really should not let uh, the administration of Donald Trump, the GOP, right-wing think tanks, or CEOs frame this rush to unsafely send people back to work as a reopening, because what they are in fact doing is unraveling the conditions that we need to have an actual safe, just, and sustainable reopening. So in order to actually have our society reopen again to do all of the things we desperately want to do, which is, you know, stroll through the park safely without a mask, um, go to the library, go to work without fear, in order to do those things in a way that's at all just, the first thing you need to do is contain coronavirus. Um, that's what shelter in place is for. Shelter in place is for not only containing the coronavirus, but also putting aggressive public health measures in place so that you can have the level of containment that you need to actually have a safe reopening. Um, the Trump administration has not been putting any of those public health measures in place in any kind of a coordinated and effective way. So as a result, this important time that we have to move towards an actual safe reopening has been largely squandered. But another thing that you need to have a reopening that's anything like safe or just is you need to give people a way to survive during the very difficult containment process. So on the one hand, we have Republicans sending us into a very lethal dangerous, hasty, quote, reopening that we know is going to kill large numbers of people. And we, based on the evidence we have so far, um, Black and Latino people are going to disproportionately bear the burden of the deaths, which is a really horrific thing. And then on the Democrat side, what we're seeing is people supporting shelter in place instructions, but not giving people a way to survive while they're sheltering in place. So for people to shelter in place, um, you really need to be paid to stay home. That's really the only just way to do this. The labor union UE is calling for people to be paid to stay home. But instead, what we're seeing from Democrats is, you know, paltry one-time payments, um, unemployment insurance that undocumented people do not qualify for at all, according to One Fair Wage. 44% of people across the country who have applied for unemployment have not yet received it. Um, so it is also incredibly unjust to not give people the things that they need to survive while sheltering in place. So, you know, what I think we need is a coordinated, holistic, um, social justice based approach to a crisis that allows us to collectively. Uh, move forward without sacrificing human lives and without leaving anyone behind or consigning anyone to destitution, poverty, or hunger, or potentially losing everything. 
And I think that the left has a big role to play in defining and determining what that looks like in this moment. So one thing that I, I think a lot of us noticed is how, you know, you had, especially on in May Day, you had workers protesting around the country and around the world saying that, you know, we're being forced to go into essential workers, being forced to go in and work under very unsafe conditions. And that, that you know, that got little media coverage compared to these reopen protests, which are astroturf because, you know, similar to the way the, the Tea Party, uh, you know, in 2010 under President Obama, um, you know, claimed to be this organic grassroots movement. Um, there's actually evidence now that these reopen protests are funded by some of the wealthiest, most corrupt, you know, uh, organizations on the planet. And you write, um, with the funding from the Koch Foundation, ExxonMobil, and a bevy of wealthy donors, the Heritage Foundation is at the center of the political efforts to prematurely restart the economy. Um, talk about um, who these groups are and also what they're doing to sort of pull these strings um, to, to really astroturf these protests that are ongoing to this day. Even as 48 states have started to reopen, um, you know, they're pushing for a rapider and wider reopen. So just to be clear, um, there are several Koch-funded think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, ALEC, Americans for Prosperity. Um, they have at least publicly distanced themselves from the actual reopen protests. There was a Politico art article that came out a few weeks ago um, in which uh, Koch-funded orgs tried to distance themselves from the protests. Those protests are still being astroturfed by wealthy organizations. For example, Freedom Works um, is highly involved in those protests, as well as white supremacist organizations. Um, but the Koch funded think tanks, while publicly disavowing the actual protests, are doing incredibly aggressive lobbying and advocacy work, pushing for an unsafe sending of people back to work. Um, so, you know, they are in, on legislator calls, they are lobbying, they are getting op-eds placed in outlets, they are, um, you know, the Heritage Foundation is very influential in the Trump administration, it actually had a role in the Trump administration's transition team, um, along with, you know, the Heritage Foundation history goes way back, it was involved in the sort of Reagan era tax cuts, um, and has been behind a lot of the really anti-worker, anti-poor people and racist legislation of our times. For example, um, the Heritage Foundation claims uh, that it had a big role in pushing Trump to pass work requirements for food stamps. Um, and so a lot of these co-funded organizations that have decades long histories, opposing unions, fighting the gut public programs have been very aggressive from the outset of the coronavirus crisis saying we should send people back to work um, knowing full well that it's going to mean that people die um, and they are essentially continuing what they've always been doing but they are doing so in escalated conditions because now they've proven that they're willing to call for an unsafe quote reopening knowing that people are going to die um, so while they might publicly distance themselves from the actual protests, it's very much part of uh, a similar, or they, they have similar goals to the protests. And they, you know, you could argue that they're far more influential um, with the Trump administration and with the Republican Party overall in pushing those goals. And you are totally right that the reopen protests which were astroturf and far smaller than the waves of labor militancy and strikes and people being very courageous um, have gotten, you know, the, re the quote reopen protests have gotten far more attention, um, which is really too bad um, because, you know, workers are being incredibly brave. They're fighting for their lives. They're speaking out. You know, I think um, there's been this sort of patronizing head patting line out there saying like essential workers are heroes um and i think so one of our reporters hamilton nolan did a piece where he interviewed a bunch of grocery store workers um and a lot of them told him like like no i don't want to be risking my life i'm here against my will i'm here because i have no other way to survive um 
I, I want to live. This is not this is not by choice. Um, and so there's a profound amount of economic coercion, just implicit in the way we use the word essential workers. You know, economic coercion, disciplining labor, um, and I think that the ways that workers are fighting back and organizing. Um, and banding together in solidarity in this moment um, are incredibly powerful and deserve way more coverage. And finally, Sarah, um, to kind of build off your point about how uh, essential workers, you know, they're being they're being allegedly honored um, for you know for sacrificing, you know, putting their lives at risk, which many of them don't want to do. Um, but that that you know that really made me think of the the military flyovers we've been seeing over the hardest hit cities. Because you know these are planes that cost millions of dollars. Um, it costs tens of thousands of dollars per hour to keep them in the air. Um, but you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that the pen the role that the military and Pentagon plays and everything from the budget. You know, more than half our discretionary budget goes to the Pentagon. Um, to this piece that you wrote um, titled "The Pentagon Wants Workers in Other Countries to Risk Their Lives for U.S. Armed Industry Profits." In it, you write. Um, you know, workers are being asked to risk their lives, or as one union that represents general dynamic workers in Maine put it, become sacrificial lambs so that the U.S. war machine can keep humming. Um, talk about the 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 the, work, the union and the workers you talk to, and um, you know what that what that situation is like. So there are many layers to the injustice of what you just described. The first thing is that the U.S. military's um, belligerence and aggression is making the world far more vulnerable to coronavirus and is making the world a far more dangerous place. Um, five years of U.S. Saudi onslaught on Yemen have left the country's healthcare system really decimated, um, yet you know, U.S. Saudi bombings have continued during the crisis, and now Yemen has a coronavirus outbreak that could be really horrible because of those conditions. The US ratcheted up um, sanctions on Iran, um, even as doctors warned that people were dying in large numbers because sanctions were cutting off vital supplies like ventilators. Um, we saw the US deploy a ship to the Caribbean to hedge against Venezuela. Sorry, more than one ship, it was a few ships. Um, and we saw, um, we're seeing China, so we're seeing the US ratchet up militarily in terms of rhetoric towards China at a time that we need global cooperation to deal with a global pandemic. All of these acts of aggression hurt most the people in those countries that are being targeted by aggression, but also hurt the whole world because this is a global pandemic. So an outbreak anywhere affects the whole world everywhere. You know, we're told that we need all of this military spending for, quote, national security. I think we're seeing right now that the U.S. military does not keep anyone safe and that the whole framework of national security um, is a false framework. So given that, um, the U.S. have invoked uh, national security as a reason that we need to um, keep the defense industrial base going during this crisis. So the, the, the U.S. defense industrial base has been declared essential, which means that workers who build tankers and bombs and drones here in the U.S. are being told, we still need you working because the work that you do is essential. Um, so because of the reasons I mentioned, we should, we should reject that framework altogether. On top of that, um, workers that I talk to are not happy that their lives are being risked um, for something that one could argue, or you know, for something that they think is not essential. So I talked to one uh, worker who works for a contractor for Lockheed Martin who requested anonymity. Um, and he said that it's really scary. You know, he's going to work every day. He doesn't have um, social distancing conditions. Someone at his facility um, had tested positive for coronavirus. Um, as you mentioned, um, the union that represents General Dynamics workers in Bath, Maine, um, said that workers are being treated like sacrificial lambs. Um, so all of that is really horrible. On top of that, there's even a more belligerent thing that's happening, which is the Pentagon is mobilizing to pressure Mexico and India to uh, to uh, push workers in their countries 
who are either suppliers or subsidiaries for US arms companies to keep going to work. So it's this idea that workers in other countries, in Mexico and India, have to put their lives at risk for the sake of US arms companies like Lockheed Martin. Um, and so, um, you know, this is just a whole other level of injustice because, you know, uh, poor and working people in the US already don't have a very much say about the actions of the US government or military, but a, but a worker in Mexico or India has no say. So the idea that they would sacrifice um, their safety, that they would take their lives into their hands um, for the purpose of US weapons companies being able to do manufacturing of weapons that are in turn making the whole world more dangerous at a time of profound vulnerability um, is just completely unconscionable and I think deserves a lot more attention. You know, I think we can't talk about the coronavirus crisis like it's just a domestic crisis to be dealt with domestically. Um, the U.S. has 800 military bases around the world. The, you know, the U.S. helms the biggest military empire humanity has ever seen. Um, you know, that empire needs to be dismantled and needs to right now immediately take its neck or take its boot off of the neck of people in other parts of the world trying to survive a profound crisis. All right, Sarah Lazar, uh, web editor and reporter for In These Times. Thank you so much for sharing some of your incredible reporting in these last few months. We know it's a challenging time for everybody, but you know, it's important that we you know, stay connected to these different struggles happening around the world and recognize the role that we can play in, in you know, helping or at least you know, decreasing the suffering that's happening in the rest of the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.